Ebola epidemic. I'm joined in the studio by Mead Over. He's an author on world health issues and an economic development analyst. And we want to thank you for coming in. Mead, you've been writing about the, uh, you know, the economic piece of this epidemic. And I, I think people don't really think a lot about that. And as I was mentioning to you before, uh, in, in, before we did this interview, that uh, I had just heard uh, a medical worker in Sierra Leone talking about how bodies are stacked outside of the hospital. They don't even have the body bags because the airlines aren't flying into these Ebola-plagued uh, countries. And that's a piece people aren't really focused on. Talk to us about the economic dimension of all of this. So on that specific point, Mike, I want to point out that um, think about an army. If you have an army, for every soldier, there are at least 20 people backing them up, the cooks, the drivers, the transport people, the people who take care of everything he needs to be on the front line. It's exactly the same with these doctors who are there trying to treat these patients. They, the MSF people have been great. They've been heroic. But they don't have those 20 people behind them to get them the body bags that you just mentioned and the IV fluids and the all the other, the personal protective gear. They don't have those things, and therefore they're, they're handicapped, and that's why President Obama's commitment and the commitments of the other countries that you've mentioned are so important. We need to strengthen that logistical supply so we have the 20 or the 30 people behind the doctors to help them do their job. So that's not on the economics so much, but we can segue to that. Well, talk mm -hmm. to us about what needs to happen on the economic side, because this is a country, these countries, I mean, they were racked at least two of them, with civil war for years, That's right. their health care system's not very good to begin with. And then when you think about mm -hmm. the trade that, uh, that goes through planes coming in, dropping yeah. off stuff, I mean, they, they are really getting hit on a lot of different fronts, right. aren't they? So the thing that to remember is that we've had 2,800 deaths. 2,800 deaths seems like actually a very small amount. It's a, it's a fraction of the deaths from malaria, from HIV, and from other diseases in these countries. But the economic impact is already far in excess of what one would expect with that number of deaths. And that's because of what we call aversion behavior. Now, there are two types of aversion behavior. There's the aversion behavior of the people in the country who fear actually going to the marketplace, fear going to work, the employers who, who fear opening their factories to workers. That's uh, the domestic side of the aversion. And that is, uh, that's a a crippling thing for these countries, which are, have begun to grow. Last year, they were growing like crazy, fa much faster than the U.S. even. And now their economies are just collapsing. The other part, though, is the part that I think you were th referring to. That's the international aversion behavior. The international aversion behavior is when international partners, international trade people, uh, the airlines, the transport networks, actually fear contact with the country and avoid it, and therefore handicap the battle against Ebola, but also cripple the economy of the country so that the people who are healthy, the vast majority, millions of people who are healthy, can't actually go to work and make a living. How do you turn that? How, how do you flip the switch? Well, that's a good point. Obviously, the first thing to do is to turn this epidemic and to, to solve the problem. We've got this problem where the epidemic is growing exponentially, but it's almost impossible to make the logistics grow exponentially. The, exp the, the logistics are growing linearly. They have been growing linearly. The, the epidemic has been racing ahead. So with all of the, um, the people contributing, all of the countries contributing and all this money, uh, the promises of money are one thing, but we have to get the logistics going. And that's what so many people are now working on so hard. If that happens, we can, the first step, the first part of the answer to your question is to, is to have people in these countries and the international actors see that the epidemic is starting to curb down. But I think there are two more things that are very important. Um, one of those is that at the national level, you have to have leadership. And uh, you have to have leadership about going back to work and uh, habituating to this epidemic as we, as we bring it under control. So we have to see the government workers themselves, the leaders, the cabinet ministers, go about their daily business. But it's also necessary for the international community to provide the new infrastructure, if necessary, in the airports and in the seaports so that international traders can feel secure docking in those seaports or landing in those airports. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but it's a fascinating subject. Thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Okay.